סוד, סוד, ורטוט! לך אחורה! ברק אובמה שם הניו! ברק אובמה שם הניו! Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City. On the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. Today we range from occupied Palestine to Yemen to Times Square, New York for a demonstration about Syria. On August 17th, the army of the so-called Jewish State of Israel destroyed 15 ancient olive trees, some dating back two to 3,000 years. This took place in Beit Jala, which is in the western part of Bethlehem. Israel is intending to close off the most fertile valley of Beit Jala from the 55 families who own the property as a state, as a step to confiscating that land. It's been done many, many times before. You'll see video of a demonstration in Bejala about a week or ten days later. It was taken by Mazen Kumsia, whose voice you'll hear in the video. انتم مجرمين حرب انتم انتم مجرمين حرب اللي بتعملوه عيب الشوم عليكم اللي بتعملوه shame on you for what you are doing protection protection of destruction and of theft of land you're protecting the destruction and theft of land that's what you are you're like pirates that's what you are thieves thieves that's what you are Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you for what you are doing. You cannot say you're obeying orders, because these are illegal orders. Illegal orders. Israel Dowlet Irhab For about 10 years now, the people of Be'elin on the West Bank have been opposing the apartheid wall, which steals much of the land of their town. Every Friday, they have a demonstration. You might have seen it in the film Five Broken Cameras. This man, Iyad Barnat, is one of the leaders of the demonstrations. Here, he's getting an award for his nonviolent activism. He was supposed to do a speaking tour of Britain and Ireland this September. However, on August 28th, he was beaten by Israeli troops and two of his ribs were broken. His doctors tell him not to move for a month. 
his tour has been canceled and he is in great pain. Please remember your government supports Israeli actions against Palestinians to the hilt, and we all help to pay for that. As I speak, Saudi King Salman is visiting Washington, D.C. It's been a busy summer for King Salman. He's just back from a vacation in the French Riviera with his retinue of a thousand. At the same time, the Saudi-U.S. war against Yemen grinds on. Yemeni deaths are approaching 5,000. Here's a new campaign that started this week. A coalition of groups, including our own Middle East Crisis Committee, that flatly calls for an end to the U.S.-Saudi alliance. The site features something not mentioned much in the media, the immense cost to the U.S. of its defense of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf monarchies. Since the time of President Carter, the cost to the U.S. has been over eight trillion dollars. That according to a study by Professor Roger Stern of Princeton. The site features a link to a petition calling for the U.S. to close down its Gulf bases and to bring its troops and sailors home now. From Democracy Now!, a look at the Yemen war and the Saudi-U.S. use of cluster bombs. As we turn right now to Yemen, um, we turn to Yemen uh, because, well, a Saudi-led airstrike killed 36 civilians working at a bottling plant in the northern province of Hajjah on Sunday. Another attack on the Yemeni capital, Sana'a, hit a house and killed four civilians. The news comes amidst new evidence the Saudi-led forces have used cluster munitions in Yemen. Human Rights Watch said it found U.S.-made cluster munition rockets likely used in at least seven attacks in Hajjah between late April and mid-July. Dozens of civilians were killed or wounded, both during the attacks and later, when they picked up unexploded submunitions that detonated. Neither the United States, Saudi Arabia or Yemen have joined the global convention banning the use of cluster munitions. Yesterday, I spoke to Human Rights Watch executive director Kenneth Roth and started by asking him what Human Rights Watch found in Yemen. As you note, the fact that um, the relevant countries have not ratified the Cluster Munitions Treaty, um, while it would be helpful to do so, it's not decisive, because all of them have ratified the Geneva Conventions, which prohibit indiscriminate warfare. And cluster munitions are, by definition, indiscriminate. They scatter over wide areas, so they should never be used in, in civilian populated areas to begin with. Um, plus, they leave a, a residue. Not every munition explodes on contact with the ground, and they become anti-personnel landmines for people to just stumble upon and die. So the U.S. should be using pressure on the Saudis um, not to be using these weapons at all, but certainly not to be using them in populated areas, whereas we're seeing Yemenis are being killed. Explain what these weapons are and what they do. They're essentially area denial weapons. Um, there is a canister with, you know, upwards of 200 submunitions, little bombs inside. The canister opens in the sky and spreads these submunitions over a wide area. Each one of those is lethal. So you don't want to be in that area as these things rain down on you. You also don't want to walk through that area afterwards because it becomes effectively a landmine field because these cluster munitions are unreliable and a significant number don't initially explode. They only explode later when somebody touches them or stands on them. How do they affect the human body? They, they're devastating. They're like standing on a landmine. They, they um, at minimum, will rip off your, your limbs and they very frequently are completely lethal. I want to turn to a video released by Human Rights Watch featuring interviews with victims of cluster munitions in Yemen. We were together and a rocket hit us. It exploded in the air and cluster bombs, submunitions fell out of it. Before we left the house with the sheep, Two submunitions fell down while others spread all over the village. One exploded and the other still remains. My cousin and I were wounded. 
Three brothers were killed, two children and one adult. It hit us while we were sleeping and we were all wounded, including my brothers. I can't walk, my mother carries me. She gets me out, washes me, as well as my brother. My whole body is wounded. My dress was burned that night, my hands were burned, and my bones were broken. Those were victims of cluster munitions in Yemen. Ken Roth is executive director of Human Rights Watch, which put out this video. Um, so talk about what Saudi Arabia is doing right now in Yemen. Well, Saudi Arabia is leading a coalition which is fighting the, the Houthi rebel forces in Yemen, and it's repeatedly using indiscriminate forms of warfare. A big part of the problem has been these cluster munitions, but we've seen time and time again that even more targeted weapons are being targeted in the wrong place. These are sophisticated weapons. Um, the Saudis should be able to target them only at military targets, but we're finding often that they're not, and that's why we're seeing such a significant civilian toll. So they're being used to terrorize. They're, well, they're being used, at least um, without much care, as to who is hit. There is a sense that, particularly in the, the northern areas, which are predominantly Houthi, that there's not so much concern about civilians. I mean, the U.S. just sealed a deal with Saudi Arabia for military weapons and jets. That's the largest deal in the world. The, the U.S. obviously um, views Saudi Arabia as a major supporter of, of the U.S. military complex, you know, and, and um, airplane producers and the like um, need these contracts, think they need these contracts in order to continue to be profitable. Um, that shouldn't be happening at the expense of civilians on the ground. The U.S. should be willing to live by the principles that it is um, theoretically signed up for in the Geneva Conventions and ensure that anybody it sells arms to is not using those arms to indiscriminately kill civilians, as the Saudis have been doing. Human Rights Watch is calling for a U.N. inquiry into violations on all sides in Yemen? Um, absolutely. In fact, there is a conference coming up reviewing compliance with the new Cluster Munitions Treaty. And one of the problems is that um, the U.K., Canada and Australia, all of which have joined the Cluster Munitions Treaty, are pushing to water down this inquiry. They're, they're trying to put allegedly in front of the, the, the evidence we have that um, Saudi clusters have killed civilians in Why? Yemen. Uh, they're doing the U.S. bidding. Why does the U.S. want to water this down? Well, I, I mean, the U.S. thinks that cluster munitions are legitimate weapons. Um, the U.S. still hasn't signed on to the Landmines Treaty. So the U.S. is very much behind the rest of the world, as most nations of the world want to ban these inherently indiscriminate weapons. Uh, the U.S. has a huge arsenal of them. It doesn't um, want that arsenal limited, and it hates the idea of treaties that are restraining the Pentagon on humanitarian grounds. It lives with the Geneva Conventions because it understands that those f help to fight a better war. But the add-ons that, that Human Rights Watch and others have pressed, the, the Landmines Treaty, the Cluster Munitions Treaty and the like, um, the Pentagon hates and has prevented Obama from, from signing on to them and is trying to undermine enforcement um, using U.S. allies around the world to do that. How much difference does mass protest make around something like this? I think it makes all the difference in the world. In other words, Obama doesn't want to be seen as underwriting indiscriminate warfare, even if it is on the other side of the world. Um, if it happens under the radar screen, if, if the Pentagon is able to push this quietly, there's no big political cost to Obama. But um, I think rabble-rousing and, and publicity helps make Obama responsible, and he's going to have a hard time standing up and saying, I don't really care about indiscriminate warfare. Just to be clear, the landmine treaty that the U.S. also has not signed on to, that's the one that Princess Di was pushing so many years ago, right, among many other people. Precisely. And, in fact, the U.S. government is um, has limited the use of landmines. And, and even though it hasn't joined on to the treaty, it recognizes that these are weapons that are extremely difficult to use because of public relations problems. And so there has been a real shift at the Pentagon. We haven't seen that shift yet in any significant way with cluster munitions. So you have this situation where people are being struck, civilians are being struck by cluster munitions, uh, by the Saudi-led um, attacks on Yemen. Yet, Saudi Arabia continues to lead a blockade against people leaving. Can you explain what's happening there? Well, there's an enormous humanitarian crisis in Yemen. Um, it is already a country that is very dependent on, on international assistance for basic things like, like water and the like. And, and because the Saudis have been blockading the country, trying to prevent fuel and other things from getting into Yemen as part of its effort to fight the Houthi rebels, 
the Yemeni people are suffering. And we're seeing enormous numbers of people who are facing malnutrition and even starvation because of the de deprivation caused by this blockade. I mean, the figures are amazing. According to the U.N., 21 million Yemenis, a staggering 80 percent of the population, need assistance, and half the population is facing hunger, famine. More than 15.2 million people lack access to basic health care, and over 20 million lack access to safe water. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. And it really underscores the importance of, of making clear that if you're going to go to war, Yes, you shoot at the other side's combatants, but you can't use means that cause the entire civilian population to suffer. And that's what the Saudi-led coalition is doing in Yemen today. Human Rights Watch Executive Director Ken Roth speaking. What needs to be emphasized is that this is a Saudi-U.S. war against Yemen. The Obama administration enthusiastically sells weapons to the Saudi regime. It coordinates the air attack against the Yemeni targets, and ships of the U.S. Navy participate in the blockade of Yemen. Months ago, Fox News reported that the immense aircraft carrier, the USS Theodore Roosevelt, and another U.S. ship were taking part in the blockade. Now to Times Square in Manhattan on the 21st of August on the second anniversary of the Assad regime's hideous chemical attack on Ghouta. I understand you're from Aleppo. Things are pretty horrible over there. Can you tell us things about Aleppo? Well, Aleppo is a very old city. You know, it's been there for more than 4,000 years. And we know that Abraham passed from there and maybe lived for a while over there. And it's always a good, a good city. 
you know, it's the location is very strategic among all those three uh, continent, Europe, Europe, uh, Asia, and Africa, and Africa. And actually, over the years, Aleppo well known for the trade, and well known for its you know beauty, uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, what all kind of beauty really, including the literatures and uh, including the uh, um, engineering, including everything really. And it's a huge city, a very it's, big it's, city. It's a very huge city, more than four and a half million people really, and a lot. And basically, it's the financial capital for Syria. And the people over there very active, very well educated, and maybe that's why the Assad regime is, uh, is mad at them. Aleppo has, you know, it's well-known city for revolting against anybody who wants to occupy it for, for the centuries. Lately, 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 you know, the French, they were kicked from Syria, from Aleppo, and 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 some other you know occupier and the Assad was mad at Syria since 1980. The Assad family. Assad family. Yeah. So the demonstration started in 2011 in Aleppo. It's 2012, actually. Uh -huh. Yeah, the, the 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 Syrian people, I mean the uh, Alebonian or the Aleppo people, they were, you know, trying to see how things will go and they're trying to, you know, get ready, because once they start, they are not going to back up back off and once they started in 2012 they continue and that's why also the asset was so mad you know he couldn't contain the revolution the revolution spread out in the whole syria especially the north and the and the west and you know he bombarded and maybe destroyed half of the city up till now and killed more than maybe 50,000 people including women children and elderly so who is in control of aleppo now or, or is it disputed no, Aleppo, most of it, most of it, you know, in the hand of the Syrian Free Army. Part of it being in the hand of the regime, but, you know, they trying to, maybe a month ago, the, the, the Syrian Free Army, they tried to kick out the regime. But, you know, the terrorist group helped the regime to, you know, to prevent that. Which, but, which group did? The Daesh group. You know, the terrorist group. ISIS. Yeah. ISIS. Uh -huh. ISIS, you know, they stand by the regime to prevent kicking out the regime from whatever left in, in Syria and it's their end. Mm -hmm. Well, today is the two-year anniversary of the chemical attack. What are your feelings today about that? Well, it's always bad feeling, bad, 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 bad remembering th those things and actually the bad thing that nothing did anything about the about this and many red line was crossed uh, uh, which was put by Obama you know but everything was crossed and 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 somebody delayed knocking down the Assad regime and as far as the Assad regime will continue as far as the killing and the massacres and the atrocities will continue in Syria so the the end of this will be should be ending the Assad regime and ending all his supporter including Iran Hezbollah and Russia you know from you know what do you think of asking for all the foreign and peoples to get out of supporting all of the sides? Like well, the Saudis and uh, Qatar? And well, the, you know, those people, sub, I think, you know, Saudi and Qatar, they're helping the Syrian people. But they're helping them, you know, in a humanitarian aid. And the Syrian people, they don't need food, really. They need, they need some movement to knock down the airplane, which is, you know, destroying the, 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 the building and the cities and killing the people. And they need the anti-tank, which is bombarding the, the building and the civilian. We don't need food over there. We need some help to get rid of the regime. Now, we in MEC don't call for any no-fly zone or U.S. Empire military support of any side in Syria. We remember very well what the U.S. did and what the U.S. supported in Libya and can see the chaos there and the increasing power of ISIS in that country. The best thing for the left to do would be to work to keep all foreign forces and weapons out of Syria, to embarrass and speak out against the Saudis, the Russians, the Iranians, and Hezbollah. So, Bill, you're wearing chemical massacre in Syria two years ago. What are your thoughts today? Well, I actually got this T-shirt one year ago today when I was standing here in Times Square. 
on the first anniversary of the Gouda massacre. And now it's a second year, and I can't believe this shit is still going on. And what can be done? I mean, a lot of people look at it and they see 50 different sides and they throw up their hands. What should the left be saying about this? Well, the left should um, stop equivocating on the whole matter and recognize that Assad is a, uh, is a fascist war criminal, for starters. Mm -hmm. now, you don't take, uh, you discount any of the criticism of the UN and Human Rights Report. Some people claim that uh, possibly Assad's people didn't do this Guta massacre. That theory has been utterly discredited. Any uh, dispassionate look at the facts indicates that it was Assad's people who did it. All right, assuming then if the left said, you know, all got together and condemned Assad, what, what could be done? What could be demanded? Uh, I mean, some people here are talking about a no-fly zone, and that bothers me a little bit because I remember what happened in Libya, which looks like a disaster. Well, you know, yeah, Libya looks like a disaster. I don't hear anybody uh, on the left saying that the um, that the Russians could have should have continued to suffer under the czars forever because, you know, then Stalin came along and it turned into a disaster. I never hear anybody on the left say that. I would love to know when the left all of a sudden became so suspicious of revolution. There's something utterly perverse about it. And so what particular do you have particular demands that you think would be good for the movement well i'm not making uh, any demands of the united states government per se i'm not making policy prescriptions i speak for the american left i'm making demands on the american left good. that they throw in their lot with the with the syrian people and not with the brutal dictator who is massacring the syrian people in our closing credits, a Latouf cartoon about the decision of the Slavish Egyptian judges to give three Al Jazeera journalists three years in jail for the crime of doing their job. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. Thank you.